In the last video, I introduced proofs for predicate logic. In this video, we're going to look at models, which are another way of analyzing arguments. There are two great traditions in logic when it comes to asking what makes the argument from premises to conclusion good. We've already seen one answer to this question. The first option is to say that there is a proof which gets you from those premises to the conclusion. But there's another option. Uh, which says that an argument is good when there's no counterexample to the argument, when there's no way to make all of the premises true and the conclusion not be true too. We're going to have a look at one way of making this second option precise. Uh, we're going to introduce a way of representing these ways to make things true in a very simple notion called a model. We're going to introduce models to the language of predicate logic. The key idea with a model is that it gives us all and only the information that we need to figure out whether or not a sentence in the language of predicate logic is true. Now, if you think about the sentences in the language of predicate logic, they're made out of uh, predicates and terms, and then they're combined using the connectives and the quantifiers. Uh, the terms, these are the things which represent objects. And the predicates uh, talk about the properties or relations that, are, that these objects might have. So what we'll need to interpret the language to figure out whether or not a sentence is true is something to interpret the objects, something to figure out what the objects represent, and then what properties they might have. So. Our models will involve a domain. A domain is a collection of objects. What kind of objects? It doesn't matter. We're not going to say anything, put any restrictions on what kind of objects, how large the collection might be, how small the collection might be. All we need is some collection of objects for our names to name, for our variables to range over. Then, for each predicate in the language, we need to interpret it. And for each name in the language, we need to interpret that. What does that mean? Well, for a name, we need an object in the domain for the name to name. And for a predicate, we need a rule which provides a truth value for every appropriate number of things from the domain. So, for example, if we have a one-place predicate, we need a truth value for every single object in the domain. But if I have a two-place predicate, I need a truth value for every pair of objects in the domain. That's a two-tuple. If I had a uh, three-place predicate, I'd need a truth value for every triple of objects in the domain. And as I said, if I have a name in my language, I need to interpret that by selecting an object for that name to name. And I just bundle that stuff together, and that is a model. A model is a domain and an interpretation. So let's take a look at an example. Let's select something where I've got a domain with three objects, which I'll just call A, B, and C. In a model like this, a one-place predicate can be interpreted just by a table that assigns a truth value for each object. And a two-place predicate can be interpreted by a table assigning values for each pair of objects, like this. So if my language contains a one-place predicate f, in this case, I've represented what it is for f to be true in my model of the object a. That's what this one here means uh, against the a row. And it's false of the object b, and it's true of the object c. So we can tell everything that we need to know about the predicate f in this domain. So if we're only considering three objects, A, B, and C, then we know everything that F needs to tell us. It's true of A and C, and it's false of B. And if L is a two-place predicate, we can do the same thing in this square table here, which we uh, read like this. If I want to figure out whether L, A, A is true, I see this uh, value in the table, and I see it because there's a one there, L, A, A is true and LAB is false, and LAC is true, and LBA is false, and LBB is true, and LBC is false, etc. So here, L is this two-place predicate, which describes a relation, 
which holds of some pairs of things and fails of others. Now, given this definition, I can figure out whether or not a sentence is true using these rules. If I have a pr uh, predicate F, which is an N place predicate, uh, applied to the terms A1 up to AN, this is true according to the model, just when my interpretation of the predicate assigns the value true to whatever the term A1 names, the term A2 names, etc., and the term AN names. So I just look up whatever the term's name, and then I look in the value of the, the interpretation of the predicate to see whether I've got a 1 or a 0 in that relevant slot of the table. 1 true, 0 false. Then a negation is true in my model just when the thing negated is not true. A conjunction is true just when both conjuncts are true. Disjunction is true just when one or other, maybe both, of the disjuncts is true. Conditional is true just when the antecedent isn't true or the consequent is. So the only way to make a conditional false is to make the antecedent true and the consequent false. A universally quantified sentence is true if and only if each instance is true where the name A is a standard name. Existentially quantified sentence is true if and only if some instance is true for some standard name. Now what's a standard name? They're just our way of making sure that we've got a name for every object in a model. So if I have a particular model that I'm wanting to reason about, the standard names for that model are just selected so that each object in the model has got one and only one standard name. And the interpretation of the name is going to be the particular object that that name picks out. So it's just a collection where we use the, usually the same letters that we use in specifying the domain. If I listed the domain out, we'll just add to our language those letters as names for the objects in the domain. In this way, the truth of a universally quantified or an existentially quantified formula can be defined in terms of the truth of other formulas, just the instances of the quantified formula where I plug in each of the standard names. Now, in general, languages aren't like this. We don't have a name for every object in the universe. We don't have a name for every object in a domain that I might have chosen. But introducing standard names is just a very helpful shorthand for reasoning about uh, whether or not a formula is true in a model. So let's see how this works. Here I have my domain. Again, my domain is just the objects A, B, and C. And I'm interested in the truth values of these three formulas that I have here. For every x, fx, uh, there is an x such that lxx, and for every x, there is a y, lxy, and lyx. We'll start with for every x, fx. This formula is true if its instances fa, fb, and fc are all true. And we'll see here that FA is true, so this gets a tick, and FC is true, so that gets a tick, but FB is not true, so that one isn't true. So we can say that for every X, FX is false in our model, or I might say its negation is true. So we'll say for every X, FX, is false in this model. Let's have a look at the next one. There is an x such that lxx. This is going to be true if one of these instances is true, laa, lbb, or lcc. And if I look at this table here, I'll see that laa is true, lbb is true, but lcc is not. So this one isn't true, this is and this one is, so there is an x, fx, sorry, l, xx is true, since two of its instances are true. 
Now this last formula is a bit more complicated. It's got two quantifiers, so we'll take it quite slowly. Uh, this formula is, starts with a universal quantifier, so we always do that bit first. Uh, the universal quantifier in this case, uh, for the formula to be true, each of its instances needs to be true. So one instance is the A instance, one instance is the B instance, and one instance is the C instance. We'll take them in turn. I need, there is a Y such that LAY and LYA is true. We just plugged in A for the variable X that was bound by the quantifier. Similarly, the B instance is there is a Y such that LBY and LYB, and the C instance is there is a Y, LCY and LYC. So they're the three instances. We need each of these to be true for my formula to be true. Now, let's look at the first one. This is an existentially quantified sentence, and that has also got three instances. The first is LAA and LAA, and that's taking the value A for Y. The second is LAB and LBA, and the third is LAC and LCA. Remember, existentially quantified formula for it to be true, some instance has to be true, and the instances are just found by substituting each of the standard names in. So this even includes the case where the name A is used for both the variable X and the variable Y. No ban on that. And that's good because uh, this instance is true. LAA and LAA is true because we've got this one here in the table. So this is true. So this one is true. The uh, A instance of the universal quantifier is true. And similarly here, we can see uh, that L BB is true. So in particular, the B instance of the, uh, the B existential quantifier instance is true. So I get LBB and LBB. That's an instance of this one. I don't even need to check the other two because I know that's true. But we can't do the same thing for C uh, because LCC and LCC is not true. So let's check the other instances and see whether uh, we'll be all right here. LCA and LAC is one, LCB and LBC is the next, and LCC and LCC. We already know that that one's false. Well, LCA is true, that's this slot, LCA, and LAC is true, that's that slot. So LCA and LAC is true. So uh, this ex the A instance of our existentially quantified sentence, let me use the highlighter. This A instance is true because the A instance of that is true. This B instance of the universally quantified sentence is true because its B instance is true. And this C instance of the universally quantified sentence is true because its A instance is true. And because each of these instances of the universally quantified statement is true, the whole universally quantified statement is true. So indeed, this gets to be true. So each of these sentences turns out to be true in our model. Now, standard names are really handy uh, when it comes to modeling quantifiers. And it's the technique that we're going to use in this subject because it's very quick and easy. But as I said, uh, these aren't the only way to deal with quantifiers, and it'd be really bad if it was because there's no way we could use standard names in English uh, because uh, all of our natural languages don't have names for every object over which uh, the language quantifies. You know, there's uncountably many different numbers, and there's no way that we have names for each of them, for example. Uh, now, uh, Alfred Tarski, the really uh, important magician from the 20th century, uh, gave us an alternate way of dealing with quantifiers. And if you've done logical methods in second year, we've actually seen this, where we can do some more work in defining what it is for things to be true in a model, not just in terms of the truth values of their components, but in terms of a, a relation of satisfaction, where we say that for all x, fx is 
uh, and for some XFX in our model is to be analyzed in terms of the component FX without using names, just using the variable X. But we don't need to know whether FX is true, but we need to know whether FX is true of this or whether it's true of that, or whether it's true of each individual different object in the domain. And that depends on the value that the variable x takes. And the way that Tarski analyzed this was in terms of what he called assignments of values to variables. So in general, a formula which might contain free variables uh, is said to be satisfied by the model relative to some assignment of values to those variables. Uh, we won't go through the details of that, but it's another way of giving uh, truth value to formulas in terms of uh, this relationship of satisfaction. Now, in the first videos, we had a look at proofs. And proofs are one answer to the question, what makes an argument from premises to conclusion good? We can say that the argument is uh, provable if there's a proof which leads us from the premises to the conclusion. But now that we've got models, we could say this, we could say that the argument has got no counterexample, that there is no model where each member of the premises is true and the conclusion is not. So we introduce these two similar but different notations for uh, validity of arguments here. Here, we've got provability, and here we've got the absence of a counterexample. They're written with turnstiles, but one is a single-headed and the other is a double-headed turnstile. To give you a sense of how uh, model theoretic validity, this double-headed turnstile works, let's show, for example, that the argument uh, from the premises, something's f and something's g, to the conclusion something is both f and g, let's show that that does have a counterexample, so it's invalid. So for this, if I'm going to construct a model, I need to interpret f and I need to interpret g. And if I had a counterexample to this, I'd need some object in my domain uh, for which f was true, because I need some instance uh, for this formula to be true. I need some instance uh, of the predicate f to, to be true. So let's just call that object a. And I need some instance uh, of G to be true, but what I really don't want is F and G to be true uh, for anything. Uh, so let's uh, make F true of the object A, but G not be true of that object, and let uh, F be false of the object B, but G be true of the object B. And maybe I've got other objects like C uh, and D. Uh, for which they're both false. doesn't really matter. But here I've just constructed an uh, interpretation where my names are A, B, C, and D, standard names for the objects A, B, C, and D in the domain. And I've interpreted F as being true of A only. I've interpreted G as being true of B only. And now in this model, there is an x, fx is definitely true because fa is true. And there is an x, gx is true because uh, gb is true. But there is an x, uh, fx and gx is going to be false. Why? Because fa and ga and fb and gb are false. FA and GA is false because GA is false, and FB and GB is false because FB is false, and FC and GC and FD and GD are also false for the same reason. So we've constructed here a very simple counterexample uh, to this argument, uh, showing you that this argument is invalid. It's got a counterexample. So now there are two different sorts of things that we can make. Uh, what we've got uh, for proofs, if I can construct a proof from premises to a conclusion, uh, I know that the argument is good in the sense that it's provable. And if I can construct a counterexample to an argument, a way of making the premises true and the conclusion false, then I know the argument's bad, it's got a counterexample. Uh, so if I think of the sort of field of arguments as sort of all uh, represented out here in, in this you know, uh, 
rectangle here. It might be that I could see all of these little provable arguments over here. You know, this is provable, that's provable, that's provable. And maybe over here I've got arguments which have got a counterexample. This argument's got a counterexample, that argument's got a counterexample, that argument's got a counterexample. Uh, now, a question might be, is every argument either provable or have a counterexample? And another question might be, is there any argument that I can find a proof for and a counterexample? Hmm. That's two different questions. One is, is there a gap between the uh, provable side and the counterexample side? Are there any gaps between provability and having a counterexample? And the other is, is there an overlap between uh, provability and counterexample? Is there, is there some weird arguments where it's both provable and has a counterexample? Uh, that's the question that we're going to address uh, in the rest of this video and also in the next one. We're going to see that there's no gaps and there's no overlaps here. Uh, the fact that there is no overlaps between proofs and counterexamples is what's called a soundness theorem. Uh, one way of describing what the soundness theorem says is, is here in this very succinct uh, claim. It says that if we've got a proof from X to A, then there is no counterexample. The argument from X to A has got no counterexample. That's what's called the soundness theorem. So if there is a proof from X to A, then the argument doesn't have a counterexample. And then the converse is the completeness theorem, which says that if we don't have a counterexample of the argument, then there is a proof from the premises to the conclusion. So if we don't have a counterexample, then there is a proof that's out there which could be found. Now these are two very interesting uh, facts, and we're going to explain why they're true, or show that they are true. We're actually going to prove these facts. Now, they are very different facts because uh, they give us different things to work with. Uh, the soundness theorem tells us that if we have a proof from the premises to the conclusion, then there is no counterexample to be had. And if we're going to reason with this, that's not going to be too hard to show because we've got a proof to work with. We say that if there is this proof, then we're going to show that there is no counterexample to it. So if we've got an argument and there is a proof, then we can just sort of verify that there's no counterexample, maybe by checking the proof bit by bit. Completeness is the hard one, because this says that if we've got an argument and there is no counterexample to it, then there must be a proof from the premises to the conclusion, and that is quite another thing to prove. So we're going to leave that for next time, and in the rest of this video we'll explain why this soundness fact holds. Now the key thing which is going to enable us to uh, verify soundness is this feature about proofs, that we've precisely defined what a proof is. We did that in the previous section when we said here's what a proof is, it's made up from basic you know, assumptions just by means of these rules. This means that we can reason about them because we've precisely defined what they are and we can do what's called a proof by induction. An induction proof uh, is, consists of a base case where we want to show some property holds of things, which we'll just call widgets for the moment. We first show that it holds for the basic, the atomic widgets, the widgets which are the starting point of building your widgets. These are the basic, most fundamental ones. Then we show that this property, if it holds of some widgets that I've got, then it holds of any widgets I can make up out of those ones that I've already got. So it turns out that any widget that I could build up from the atomic widgets by means of whatever the process of making widgets is, has always got this property because the property holds of the base things. And then if I build something up, it holds of those two. And if I build something up from those, it holds of those two. And if I keep on building new widgets, the property is just going to follow along. This kind, of work, uh, this kind of proof works for many different sorts of widgets. Uh, natural numbers, for example, I could think of them as starting from zero and continuing on just by adding one 
because I want to show that something holds of some all of the natural numbers have got some property. If I show that zero has that property, and if a number has the property, so does the next one, then it turns out all the natural numbers have got that property because that's just how the natural numbers are made or defined. You could do the same thing for formulas. If the atomic formulas have got some property, uh, and if a formula's got the property, then the formulas, conjunctions, disjunctions, negations, conditional, quantifiers, etc., have got that property too, then it turns out that all formulas have got that property. And this works for proofs as well because proofs are made out of our basic proofs, which are just a single assumption, and then they're built up from proofs by means of the rules. And it turns out there's lots of these things which are recursively constructed like that, and this proof technique uh, we'll see again and again. So to see how it works with proofs, the smallest proof is just a single assumption, single formula, written down, it's the premise, it's the conclusion, that's it. And then each of the rules gives us ways to extend a proof or two proofs or three proofs in the case of the disjunction elimination rule to make a new proof. And every proof is built up in this way in a finite number of steps. That's just what it takes to be a proof. It's a finite tree made up out of this rule. So to prove soundness, we're going to use this sort of inductive argument. Soundness is the fact that if I've got a proof from X to A, then I've got no counterexample to the argument from X to A. So we'll reason like this. If pi is a proof from X to A, then there is no counterexample. The base case is the soundness fact when pi is an assumption proof. And then the inductive step is that if soundness holds already for proofs pi 1 and maybe pi 2 and pi 3, then it also holds for proofs constructed from these ones using the rules. And then if I can show those two things, the base case and the inductive step, soundness holds for all of my proofs. So here's the base case. If A is an assumption proof, well, it's a proof for the argument from A to A. So we need to show that the argument from A to A doesn't have a counterexample. But a counterexample to that argument would have to be a model where A is true and A isn't. And that's not how model wo models work. In every model, either A is true or it isn't, but not both. So we never have a counterexample to the argument from A to A. So we have soundness for assumption proofs. Example. Now, there's lots of rules, and I'm not going to explain how soundness works for each of them. We'll do that in class. I'm picking out four rules, which will give you a good idea of how all of the rules work. First, look at the conjunction introduction rule. If my proof from X to A has no counterexample, and my proof from Y to B has no counterexample, then any model where x and y are both true has got to be a model where a is true because the argument from x to a doesn't have a counterexample and has got to be a model where b is true because the argument from y to b doesn't have a counterexample. So any model where x and y are true, a and b has to be true too. And if a and b are both true in my model, given the rule for how conjunction works, a and b is true in my model too. So it follows that any model where x and y are true, a and b is true. So this is the simplest case. Uh, it turns out that if my if I have no counterexample to the argument from x to a and no counterexample to the argument from y to b, then indeed the argument from x and y to a and b has got no counterexample. Now, Many of the other rules have got this shape too. These are rules which don't discharge premises, don't have any funny business with quantifiers. All of those rules give you soundness in exactly the same way as this one. Here's a rule that discharges a premise though. Here, my proof pi is a proof from x and a to b, and I'm discharging some a's and concluding a implies b. So if my proof pi uh, is, shows us that there is no counterexample to the argument from X and A to B, then in any model where each member of X is true and A is true, then B is true. That's just what that means for that argument to have no counterexample. Now, 
That means if I've got a model where x is true, and I'm leaving a out, then either a isn't true in my model, or a is true in my model, and in that case, b is true. In other words, in those models, either a isn't true, or b is true, if all of the things in x are true. But that's just the condition for a implies b to be true. If you look back at the rules for when a implies b is true in a model, it says when a isn't true, or b is. So it turns out that in any models where x is true, uh, a implies b is true too. And that's exactly what we needed, because that's now uh, the active assumptions in this proof for x, discharge the a's, and now the conclusion is a implies b. So soundness works for extending proofs with the conditional introduction rule too. Last connective rule that I look at is the disjunction, introdu disjunction elimination rule, which is the most complicated one. It's got uh, three subproofs, pi 1, pi 2, pi 3. If each of these proofs have got no counterexamples, that means that in all of the models where x is true, a or b is true, in all the models where y and a are true, c is true, and if all the models where z and b is true, c is true, what we want is to show that in every model where x and y and z are all true, then c is true. So take the models where x, y, and z are true. Because x's are true, a or b is true. And since a or b is true in these models, if I take any of these models, uh, in that model, either a is true or b is true. So in one case, if it's a that's true, then since y is true, and we're assuming a is true, then c's got to be true too because this argument's got no counterexample. On the other hand, if it's B in that disjunction that's true, then in that case, because Z is true, Z and B are true, so in that case, C is true too. So in either of those cases, C is true. So it turns out that uh, C is true in my model. Whenever X and Y and Z are all true, then C is true. So that argument is valid too. Last thing I'll look at is this universal quantifier introduction rule. I've got a proof from x to a with the a instance. That means that in any model where x is true, a of a is true. And the name a doesn't apply appear in any formula in x. That's the condition on actually being able to apply the universal quantifier introduction rule. So it follows that in any model with the domain D interpretation I, where each member of X is true, so is AA. So what I'm going to do, because I want to prove that for all X, A of X is true, I'm going to choose an object B in the domain D. And I'm going to consider this new model where I just interpret the name A to refer to the object B instead of the name A. So I've just chosen an object in the domain at random, and I'm interpreting the name A to refer to that, and I'm keeping everything else in the model exactly the same. Now, since the formulas X don't feature the name A, their interpretation is completely unchanged. They're still true in this new model. So since in every model where all the X's are true, AA is true, the, name AA, the formula AA is true in this model too because the argument from X to AA is valid. So this model can't be a counterexample but either. But B could have been any of the objects in the domain in our model. And B is now, in this new model, the interpretation of the name A. So that means that A of B holds in my original model for whatever standard name B. I was wanting to use. So it turns out that for every x, ax is true in my model too, because the b instance is true for any choice b that I use at all. So it turns out that if the formulas in x are true, the universally quantified formula is true too. That was a lot of examples, four of them, and they were all of the different kinds of reasoning that you can get in these sorts of rules. The other rules work in exactly the same way. They've just got a slightly different shape, but the, the reasoning works in exactly the same way. So I'm going to leave them for us to do in class. 
After we've mastered models and we've understood soundness, our next step on our journey is to see how to prove completeness. But that will be for next class.